my own introduction to T.S. Eliot was rather bizarre in that I was uh, about 16 and living in the north of England in Accrington. I'd been sent to the library by my mother, Mrs. Winston, to get her usual haul of mystery stories, because that's all she ever read. She'd heard the title, Murder in the Cathedral, and she thought it was some homicidal monk business. So I went and picked that up, but it looked too small to be a mystery story, because they're normally about 200 pages long, so I thought, I'll look at this. So I sat down on the library steps and opened it, and, of course, it was Murder in the Cathedral. This is one moment, but know that another shall pierce you with a sudden painful joy when the figure of God's purpose is made complete. I opened it on the line, which said, this is one moment, but know that another shall pierce you with a sudden painful joy. And I was having a terrible time, and it made me cry because I needed to think that there would be another moment and that there would be joy. And language to me like pierce and joy was fine because I'd been brought up fiercely religious. So I immediately read the thing through and, and, and found there just this, you know, this vigour, this muscularity, but also this, this, this aching sensitivity, um, which seemed to me to be exactly the container that I needed at that moment for my own very turbulent emotions. Seven years we have lived quietly, succeeded in avoiding notice, living and partly living. There have been oppression and luxury, there have been poverty and license. There has been minor injustice. Yet we have gone on living, living and partly living. Well, Eliot himself said, if I understand a play the first time I see it, I become suspicious. I don't think it can be a good play. Well, no one could have understood any of Eliot's plays the first time through. I, 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 I think they were uh, sound dramas. I happened to talk to Alec Guinness. He was in the cocktail party. And at a final run-through, they were called on stage for notes. E. Martin Brown was the director. Alex said to him, this last four lines, I can't say there's something wrong with it. And I don't know what it is, but could we talk to Mr. Elliot perhaps about it? And he said, yes, I, and he made a note, and they went on talking. And then a figure came down from the back of the stalls out of the darkness, and it was T.S. Eliot. And Alec was rather shocked that he was there for the run-through. He hadn't been told. And he said, Mr. Guinness, would this be better? And handed him another four lines, which Alex said were superb. Eliot's ambition was to write contemporary verse drama in the manner of the great Greek and Jacobean tragedies, which he so deeply admired. He wanted to restore the transcendental aspirations of the theatre and its moral authority, which he felt had been lost. I think his mission statement would have been redemption the sense that human beings can be redeemed through a religious means. It's in every play, it's in most of his poetry, I think, too. Eliot's last play, The Elder Statesman, which he wrote in 1958, is dedicated to his second wife, Valerie. Valerie Fletcher was Eliot's secretary at Faber and Faber for eight years before he proposed to her in 1957. They kept their engagement a secret from even their closest friends and got married at six o'clock in the morning with only her parents present. the first edition of Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats, there's a cat climbing up a ladder. Well, Valerie went to an engraver and had this illustration engraved on a whiskey glass. So Tom would come home in the evening and she'd say, which step, darling? Tom would say, one, two or three, depending on how dreadful the day had been. 
My mother used to read them to me, and I always loved them, and I had them myself, and I kept them for years. I always thought that there was something about them that uh, was very musical, I guess. I mean, it's, uh, it's got to be slinky. It had to be a kind of... He's called the hidden paw because it all sets itself. It all comes from you know the way he spoke it. You could hear it. It's very very musical. I was sitting at Faber's and the phone went and it was Andrew Lloyd Webber, and he said, "Are the rights free in Old Possum's book of pra Practical Cats?" And I talked to Valerie and she was a bit sort of unhappy about that. You know, I'm not sure Tom would have liked this. And um, Andrew said, why don't you bring her round to my flat in Belgravia? And we can talk about it. And Andrew was absolutely brilliant. He played on this wonderful grand piano and sang. And Valerie was absolutely enchanted. I remember when the first cat appeared there, this hush, and then this absolute astonishment. You may think at first, I'm as mad as a hatter, when I tell you a cat must have three different names. That cats would come right up to you, and they'd come straight up to you and say, the naming of cats is a difficult matter. It isn't just one of your ordinary games. It, it had them. I mean, people were literally sort of being buttonholed by cats. On the first night, you could feel how wonderful they thought it was. And Andrew came up to me afterwards and said, Matthew, this is going to make Fabers a fortune. Sensational, new, entirely British. Cats new opened in May 1981. It ran for 21 years in the West End and for 18 years on Broadway. I'm so sorry that Andrew cannot be here tonight to receive this honour. It gives me great pleasure to accept it on his behalf and that of my husband, T.S. Eliot. So how many times do you think your husband was painted? Quite a number of times, but I have no actual count of them. I suppose the portraits have all gone out all over the place. You've got a few portraits, haven't you, of yes. him? Yes. He obviously needed to have a happy marriage. It obviously was something as though he couldn't die until he'd had it. Something he needed there. Not only as, I think, a compensation for a sense of failure over the first marriage, because deep in him there was a need for family life. Somehow there was... Uh, could be a little boy in him that somehow had never been released and came out in this way, I think. I think I was probably the first person to work for him after his marriage to Valerie. I was sitting in her seat, literally, looking out of the window onto Russell Square. To me, she was a presence. She was always well-dressed, and she always had her, her high-heeled shoes on, because that was part of, part of her persona, I think, for him, was a sort of certain buxom glamour. She used to breeze into the office quite a lot. They'd go off to lunch together. I think he was very in love with Valerie and very indulgent with her too. I, I, I had the feeling that, well, I used to order flowers for her and when she came in, he would look at her very warmly, very adoringly, really. I think he found her absolutely entrancing.
Oh, they certainly were demonstrative, yes. They didn't want to sit apart. I remember them dining here. I mean, they were jolly well next to each other. <laughs> no question. It was the first time in his life that he'd had domesticity in which he was looked after by his wife. His first wife never looked after him. And then he was always from pillar to post, um, just staying with people. He never had a home of his own until he was married, second time. Really, ideally, should have had about ten children. And he, he, he was suited in every way. He was interested in small details, interested in the home, and nothing was too small. Valerie had only one interest in life, and that was Tom's well-being. After their honeymoon, they came to dinner here, and she explained to me how she wanted to build up his health. And people didn't realize then how uh, extremely precarious he, it was. I mean, that he was in, in hospital for weeks at a time. And it was Valerie's, uh, as it were, determination to give him the heart to go on fighting. She really kept him alive, there's absolutely no doubt. Elliot's marriage was only marred by his increasingly failing health. In the winter of 1964, he was in and out of hospital and had to have oxygen in the flat. Elliot died at home in Kensington on the 4th of January, 1965. The following day, Faber and Faber had a series of photographs taken of his empty office. Home is where one starts from. As we grow older, the world becomes stranger, the pattern more complicated of dead and living. Not the intense moment, isolated with no before and after, but a lifetime burning in every moment, and not the lifetime of one man only, but of old stones that cannot be deciphered. There is a time for the evening under starlight, a time for the evening under lamplight, the evening with the photograph album. Love is most nearly itself when here and now cease to matter. Old men ought to be explorers. Here and there does not matter. We must be still and still moving into another intensity for a further union, a deeper communion. Through the dark cold and the empty desolation, the wave cry, the wind cry, the vast waters of the petrol and the porpoise. In my end is my beginning. <laughs> 